Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Most of us have seen movies or television shows where sharks have been portrayed as marauders who prey on unsuspecting swimmers or smaller fish in the sea. But many Wild Kingdom episodes illustrate how sharks and other predators are an important part of the food chain in our underwater world. Oceans cover 70% of our planet, yet we still have much to learn about this important ecosystem. Modern technology has enhanced our ability to study the oceans with minimal disruption to their habitat. Human involvement and recent legislation to protect underwater creatures allow for the resurgence of these many species. There's more good news to come in the Wild Kingdom, so sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. One of the most unusual sounds I've heard in nature is one I heard recently while diving in the ocean. Listen. That's the strange voice, as we recorded it in last week's show, of the humpback whale. This marine mammal reaches a length of 57 feet and a staggering weight of 90,000 pounds. For reasons we can't yet explain, these whales bear their calves over raised portions of the ocean floor in warmer seas. One of the problems in the whale research of Dr. Howard Wynn of the University of Rhode Island was locating the whales. Our plan was to find them visually from a helicopter and then lower a device called a sauna buoy, which contains a highly sensitive microphone. This could then pick up the whale calls coming through the water and relay them to our research vessel. In turn, this would direct us to the whales and allow us to approach them closely by boat and then go underwater for a more intensive observation of their habits than we had yet performed. We found the whales at what is called Silver Navidad Banks near the end of the Bahama chain. It was here that we joined them in their undersea world for extensive observation. And it was here as well that we once again listened to the strange and intriguing sound we'd come to know as the call of the whale. We've been searching for one of the whale herds for several days, but they've eluded us. Now we must rely on a method for locating them we've not yet used. We're nearing the rendezvous point where we're to make contact with our helicopter, which should be awaiting us on those islands ahead. In charge of the humpback whale research program is Dr. Howard Wynn of the University of Rhode Island. The university's research boat is skippered by Gary Morse, who is now putting us on a new course. I'll instruct our helicopter to begin a circuitous flight toward us, keeping alert for sight of the whales on the way. Since on this new course, it'll be a while before the helicopter arrives to pick up Marlin, Gary acknowledges instructions to stop over a nearby reef where Marlin can make a brief exploratory dive. While Gary's bringing us into position and stopping the boat, we're finishing the job of filling all our air cylinders to capacity at the compressor. 
Accompanying me on this dive will be graduate marine biologist Rick Edel, who's been assisting in the university's whale research program for six years. We'll move closer onto the reef in the large inflatable boat, which is being operated by Dave Woodward. One of the purposes of this brief preliminary dive, in addition to merely observing whatever marine life we might encounter, is to test the versatility of some electrically operated diver propulsion vehicles called DPVs. These DPVs, which Dave hands over to us, allow divers to cover much more underwater territory with much less expenditure of effort and considerably less use of air than when swimming. Even with these DPVs, though, the fundamental rules of safe diving must be observed. And Rick and I will always remain in visual contact. A wide variety of marine life exists among the shelves and crannies of the reef. As we near the bottom, Rick is first to spot something interesting. A small octopus atop a rock decides we might be a threat and jets himself away to a more secure hiding place. A short distance away, a slight movement on the bottom catches my eye. It's a long-spined urchin, seemingly invulnerable with its needle-like venomous spine. Yet, there are predators, such as this queen triggerfish, which have learned how to overcome such defenses. The queen triggerfish knows that the urchin's one point of weakness is its underside. The main danger the fish has to avoid is the possibility of one of those spines penetrating its eye. It avoids the danger well, and the small but powerful jaws of the fish quickly demolish the urchin. There isn't much to eat inside the spiny shell, but evidently the queen trigger fish feels the risk has been well worth the reward. Sometimes unusual relationships develop between marine animals such as this 40-pound grouper and the small darting fish called wrasses. When the bigger fish becomes infested with sea lice, which it can't dislodge, it visits a cleaning station, a place inhabited by wrasses. There the wrasses move with impunity all over its body to search for the lice, such as those now on the grouper's head. The wrasses fearlessly enter the gills of the bigger fish to seek out the parasites. Quite frequently, they'll even swim about inside the grouper's mouth. We've used up all the time we can afford on this dive. Rick has signaled that it's time to move back to the boat on our DPVs. Viewing the smaller undersea life is always interesting, but now it's time to find some of the largest animals of all, the whales. With the helicopter now waiting, I prepared to board directly from the inflatable boat so we could begin our aerial search for the herd of whales. Right on schedule with our prearranged plans, the helicopter is settling to pick me up at the rendezvous point. Since it would be hazardous for the helicopter to land closely to the research vessel, we've moved out to meet it. Our 
Our object on the flight will be not only to range out over the expansive Silver Navidad banks and attempt to visually locate the whale herd, but to keep its location electronically pinpointed as the helicopter returns me to the research boat. First, we'll make sure from above that the inflatable boat safely returns to the Eaglet 2. We may have a long flight before finding the whales since they range far in these Caribbean waters. We'll watch in particular for the huge splashes they make as they burst from the sea ahead of us in their spectacular jumps. Soon our luck improves. Below us, a humpback whale has just come to the surface. There's another. So it looks as if we've probably located a herd instead of just an isolated individual. We'll continue to circle here a little while to get a compass bearing on the general direction in which they're traveling. We've got the heading now, so I'll radio the word that we've found them and are preparing to drop a radio-equipped Sonoboy device. There's the first real breaching we've seen by any whale of this herd. We may as well swing around and get ready to drop the Sonoboy. These are huge whales and they seem to be surfacing all around us now. They've evidently decided to mill about in this one area. The Sonoboy we're going to lower now contains a very specialized hydrophone which not only can pick up the underwater callings of the whales to one another, but can then transmit those calls all the way back to the Eaglet 2. Even if the whale should move quite a few miles off after we drop it, the device can keep them located for us through use of a directional radio aboard the boat. Our plan is to circle a little longer for more aerial observations before going back to the boat but they'll lock in on the radio beam from the Sonoboy and begin heading in our direction right away. In the main deck control room, Paul Perkins is already trying to get a fix on the signal from the Sonoboy, while Marlin continues his radio reports on the whale activities. All zeroed in on a good signal. From the sound of those calls, it's evidently a sizable herd of humpback whales that Marlin's found. Dr. Wynn's research indicates that no more than 900 humpback whales remain alive in this part of the world, so they're hard to locate. Taking no chances on starting the herd moving away, we maintain a fairly high altitude. Uh -huh. 
I'd like to continue observing their breaching actions from above like this, but it's time we get back to the boat. The research vessel's below us now, and the small boat's heading out for the pickup. Dr. Wynn assures me that the sauna boy is performing perfectly and they're tape recording some excellent whale calls. So far, our planning has gone off with clockwork precision. Now if the whales will just continue to cooperate, and remain milling in that area until we can arrive in the big boat, we just may get some of the most important underwater data on the whales that Dr. Wynn has yet accumulated. Having returned to the Eaglet 2 after locating the whales by helicopter, we now headed toward the call of the whale being broadcast from the sauna buoy. We've been following the Sonoboy radio signal for nearly 20 miles, and its increased strength assures us we're getting close. The whale calls continue to come in clearly, meaning they're still milling in the area. From out on the end of the bowsprit walkway, there will be an excellent view as we catch up to them. There seems to be some surface activity far ahead of the boat, and Gary's ready to slow down as we approach. Now we've closed in on them. These animals grow to over 50 feet in length. This one's tail seems to be easily 12 feet wide. How beautifully they move through the water. Tape recording their actions now will be of great help later on in recalling and learning to understand the specific movements and characteristics they exhibit as they surface to breathe. The body shape as they dive clearly shows why they're known as humpback whales. Especially valuable are the on-the-spot recordings about the family habits and the movements of the calves with their parents. We rarely observe them like this, that we don't encounter at least one or two awe-inspiring breaches, sometimes by the babies but far more spectacularly by the adults. Gary announces he's going to stop now, so that's our cue to get ready for the dive among these whales. Dr. Wynn cautions against approaching the whales underwater closer than five feet. It could be very dangerous. Humpback whales aren't belligerent, but an accidental bumping could easily crush us. Still, we hope to get observations this time from as close as safety permits. We're not using the self-propelled DPVs on this dive because we don't, in any way, want to chance alarming the giant marine mammals. They're not frightened by our presence. And being able to observe the mother-baby relationship from beneath the surface may give us a great deal more valuable data on their habits than hours of watching from above could afford. 
The baby whales we're seeing were almost certainly born right here, over the silver Navidad banks. Though they obviously weigh a couple of tons each already, they're probably not more than two months old. They'll remain dependent upon their mothers for about a year. In moving closer to a mother and calf swimming this way, I experience their fantastic power in water turbulence as they pass about 10 feet from me. That sort of incident doesn't encourage moving in any closer. This whale passes me close enough for an excellent observation of the unusually shaped head. There's a good perspective. Marlin passing below a couple of medium-sized humpback whales. The tape-recorded calls of the whales aren't the only important aids in our continuing research. Equally important for later close study of these cetaceans and their actions beneath the surface are the photographs we're able to take of them down here. It appears that quite frequently, both parents will escort their baby through the water, and it is possible they are teaching it lessons of survival. Time now for me to rejoin Dr. Wynn. He's gotten some excellent pictures of the whales, including valuable shots of the baby humpback whales riding their mother's backs. However, we've been quite active on this dive and have expended most of our air supply. It's necessary now for us to begin heading back to the Eaglet II. The value of our observations today of the underwater activities of these humpback whales and their young will only be fully realized later when extensive notes are written and a close study is made of those notes in conjunction with the photographs taken and the tapes recorded. Perhaps among them, there will be clues to how we can prevent the extinction of one of the most endangered animals in the world today, the humpback whale. The work being done by such marine researchers as Dr. Howard Wynn of the University of Rhode Island has exciting potential. His studies may eventually solve many of the present mysteries about humpback whales. Questions such as which of the sexes makes the peculiar call? Why does it do so in warm seas but not when it migrates north? And what is the meaning of the call? Unfortunately, some nations are still slaughtering these animals in great numbers, and extinction looms as a very real threat. Dr. Wynn's research, which is piecing together an accurate picture of the humpback whale's life cycle, is providing us with positive information on how to protect the species. Research is the key. It lets us know enough about the endangered species that steps can be taken to ensure that the impressive humpback whale will always be with us as a marine representative of the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.